Mothers who are adopting babies or having babies by surrogate often have a desire to breastfeed. Is it possible to breastfeed and bring in a milk supply when your baby was carried by someone else? I'm Rose Davinia Jakowitz, a registered nurse, international board certified lactation consultant, and outpatient lactation clinic in San Diego at Kaiser Permanente. Today we are discussing induced lactation, breastfeeding without giving birth. This is The Boob Group, episode 46. Breast milk, it does a baby good. Silly daddy, boobs are for babies. I make milk, what's your superpower? If my breastfeeding offends you, put a blanket over your head. Dairy diva, don't be lactose intolerant. Nursing nature's own breast enhancement. Meals on heels. Whoever said there's no use crying over spilled milk, never had to pump. Breast milk, all udders are inferior. Whatever your point of view, we're here to support your breastfeeding goals. We're the boob group, because mothers know breast. Welcome to the Boob Group, broadcasting from the Birth Education Center of San Diego. I'm your host, Robin Kaplan. I'm also an international board certified lactation consultant and owner of the San Diego Breastfeeding Center. At the Boob Group, we're your online support group for all things related to breastfeeding. Have you signed up for our newsletter yet? This is one of the best ways to stay informed about our new episodes, giveaways, and blog posts. And if you sign up today, you'll be entered into one of our giveaways for a free month membership to our Boob Group Club, which gives you access to all of our archived episodes. Today, we're joined by one lovely panelist by phone. Tegline, will you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Tegline Ryan. I am 45, and I have three children. I have two biological children. Uh, My son is... 12, and my next son is 11, and then I have an adopted daughter who is 3. My profession was a classroom teacher, and now I'm a full-time mom and homeschooling my children. Perfect. Well, welcome to the show, Teglin. Glad to be here. Before we begin today's show, here's a question for one of our experts. Hi, my name is Melissa, and I am calling from San Diego, California, and I just wanted to find out if there was a recommended milk bank, a local milk bank where moms could donate their milk to and or moms could request um, breast milk from. If you could please let me know, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Hi, Boob Group listeners. This is Veronica Tingzon, International Board Certified Lactation Consultant and the owner of the Original Comfort Food Lactation Services in San Diego, California. Melissa, there really isn't a milk bank here in San Diego, California. Um, The milk banks where they actually pasteurize and uh, dole out the milk uh, are located in different areas. The closest one to San Diego is in San Jose, California. Um, But we do have a milk depot, which is a collection station um, for the transport to the San Jose uh, Human Milk Bank, um, and that's at Sharp Mary Birch Hospital here in San Diego, California. And you can always call them and see about getting your milk to the milk bank. However, first, you have to contact the Human Milk Bank of North America, and you can find that at Himbana.org, H-M-B-A-N-A dot O-R-G, um, and fill out the questionnaire to see if you are a viable candidate for milk donation. After you've fulfilled that step and that you know that you are uh, eligible for being a milk donor, then you can start transporting your milk through Mary Birch, which is then shipped out for processing and pasteurization up to San Jose, California. If you are actually in the need of purchasing the milk, uh, you usually need to have a script for that or an RX from the doctor, whether it's a neonatal doctor, a pediatrician, and you'll need to get that script so that you can start purchasing through the Human Milk Bank Association. And once again, the Milk Depot, they usually ship it to Mary Birch and uh, start doling out the milk from there. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. (laughs) 
Today on The Boob Group, we're discussing induced lactation, breastfeeding without giving birth. Our returning expert, Rose Devigny Jackowitz, has been an international board certified lactation consultant since 1984 and works at the outpatient clinic, at outpatient lactation clinic, I should say, at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego. Thanks for joining us, Rose, and welcome back to the show. Thank you, and I'm very happy to be here. So, Rose, many people are surprised to hear that a woman can lactate without having birthed a baby. How did you first get interested in this topic? I first got interested in this topic many years ago. I was at a conference with a nutritionist who was talking about how women can bring their milk back after they've stopped, and I was fascinated by that. And then I had a woman who came to me when I worked uh, um, at another hospital as a lactation consultant who said, I'm going to be adopting a baby. Um, and I want to breastfeed. I read that you can breastfeed. And then I remembered that uh, this nutrition had talked about um, bringing your milk in, and it's like, that would be great. I would love to work with you. And that's how I got started, and that's probably been 25 years. Oh, wow. Can you explain what does it mean to induce lactation? Induced lactation historically has been called adoptive nursing, but we now know it's not just adoptive nursing because as one woman put it, no, I'm not adopting the baby. I just am having another woman carry it. It's a surrogate. So it's not always just because of adopting, but basically what it means is you are uh, inducing or starting breast milk production without having the nine-month pregnancy. And, uh, and you're right, there's a lot of people that don't know. Um, I meet physicians who aren't quite aware that you can still breastfeed and make milk if you've never been pregnant. And what is the difference between induced lactation and relactation? Technically, relactation is a woman who has breastfed before, so that uh, by definition, she's breastfed before. Induced lactation is you've never breastfed, you've never been pregnant. However, those terms are used interchangeably. If you have breastfed 10 years ago and you've just adopted a baby, Technically, it's indu- it's relactation, but we still call it induced lactation because it's without the pregnancy. Okay. Um, Tegline, when did you decide that you wanted to breastfeed your adopted baby, and had you breastfed before? I had breastfed both my adopted children. I'm, I'm sorry, both my biological children. And um, when we started looking into the option of adopting, I always I always had in my mind that I wanted to breastfeed an adopted baby. I had heard about it back probably in the 80s. Um, My mom told me about it. Um, Two of my sisters are adopted, and she came and told me about a woman she had met at at the preschool where she worked who was breastfeeding an adopted baby. And she was so excited, and she said, I wish I had known about this when I had, I wish this was something available to me when I had your sisters. And um, she had heard about the supplemental nursing system, about the baby getting milk at the breast. And um, so I, I kind of always knew that it was possible. And, um, but we were adopting through foster care and didn't really know what age child was going to be placed with us or when. Um, we were saying that we were willing to take children between uh, the birth and five years old. Got it. So depending on the age of the child would kind of determine whether you were going to breastfeed or not. Exactly. Okay. Um, Rose, do all women's bodies have the ability to induce lactation and do our chances go down over time? Basically, all women do have the ability. Just like when you get pregnant, all women have the ability to breastfeed. Um, There is a difference in how much milk moms make, but as long as they have breasts and a functioning pituitary, you can induce lactation. And as far as reducing over time, again, as long as you have breast functioning pituitary, you are able to induce lactation. In fact, in some cultures, grandmothers are known to help they induce lactation when their daughters are having problems. Oh, very cool. Um, Rose, can you walk us through the steps? How does a mother induce lactation? Wow. (laughs) Where do (laughs) we begin here? Probably the first thing uh, is to uh, meet with a lactation consultant to find out what the different, there's different protocols for inducing lactation. And one of the very first questions I want to know from a mom is tell me what your goals are. And moms have different goals from, I just want to have my baby at the breast. It kind of doesn't matter if I make milk, but if I do, that's okay. To the extreme of, I want to make as much milk as possible. 
So meeting with a lactation consultant um, who has really you know, has some experience with this, and then it is important to have a primary care physician or an obstetrician involved because there can be some medications involved in the induced lactation process depending on which protocol you choose. So you do want to have your physician, and hopefully he's a breastfeeding friendly physician. Because over time, I've had health professionals as well as, you know, lay people go, you do what? Why would you want to put somebody else's baby at your breast? And I said, that's not the point. It's not somebody else's baby. Yeah, exactly. It is her baby, and she wants to breastfeed. So um, the steps can be multiple as far as the first thing is identifying what what protocol to go into. To You know, if a mom says, I want to just put the baby to breast. It really doesn't matter if I make n- much milk. There's n- really not a lot she needs to do. You know, she just needs to start nursing the baby when the baby arrives. But the mom who says, I want to maximize the milk supply and make as much as possible, um, then ideally the longer time you have to prepare. I mean, if I can have a mom for four or five months before the birth, because again, what we're doing is we're kind of tricking the body into thinking it's pregnant. And then when the baby's born, we abruptly stop some of the medications and uh, herbs uh, with pumping. And then that kind of tricks the body into thinking, aha, I gave birth, let's make milk. So the more time you have, the better your chances for making more milk. So again, if we had all day, we could go through lots of the steps. <laughs> but there, there are many steps. But the first would be to meet with somebody, uh, find out what the uh, uh, various protocols are, discuss what your goals are, and then map out that, okay, we need to do this, 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 and this, and meet with the physician to say, okay, I need an order for this birth control pill. I need an order for this. Um, And again, if you are on a protocol that has a birth control pill involved, the birth control pill is not used for birth control. It's used for breast stimulation. So you still, if you could get pregnant, you could still potentially get pregnant. You wouldn't use it as a birth control. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I was going to say, too, for our listeners that we will um, link to some of the websites that have the protocols. Um, Ask Lenore is is one of the ones that that I know I use when I'm guiding moms to induce lactation. So we'll we'll include those um, on our website, so that way you can take a look at what... Those are probably the best uh, protocols. uh, They've been used the most, that's for sure. Um, Rose, can this be done without medication? Um, And are there certain health conditions that a mom should know about? So say she's looking at the Ask Lenore website, and she's kind of doing it maybe not with a lactation consultant. Should she know that if she has a certain medical condition that she should not be, I mean, she should work with a lactation consultant anyway, but she should not be following these protocols if there's something that's going on in her own body that could that could cause yes. a problem. In fact, um, the protocols do include a section on medical conditions. Okay. So yes, there are some uh, potential conditions and probably the first one that when moms have had years of infertility and they've been on various medications, I've had them say to me, please don't tell me I have to take medicines. I don't want to take anything if I don't have to. Um, not taking some of the medicines or the herbs, um, you can still do it. It will take longer. You may not have as much milk supply. Um, But it can be done. Um, Conditions that might interfere, a woman who has a history of blood clots, she may not be a candidate for birth control pills. A woman who has a history of hypertension may not be a candidate for the birth control pills, although, again, in the protocols, it does talk about options. So it can be done without option, I mean, without medications or herbs. And there are some herbs that are less Uh, have much less side effects than some of the uh, medications. And so it is possible, absolutely. Okay. Tiglin, what was your process for inducing lactation? Did you pump? Did you take medication? What did you do? We didn't know we were getting our daughter until the day we got her. Um, Because we were adopting out of foster care, um, we never knew when there was going to be a child who needed a home. And our daughter was a safe surrender infant where she was surrendered at birth. And um, so we literally found out we were getting her and drove to the hospital to get her. So there wasn't any advanced preparation on my part because I had no idea that I was going to be coming home the next day with the baby. (laughs) So I had researched everything. So once I got home with her, I knew what I wanted to do. And I basically ordered the lactate, which is an at-breast supplementer. 
and a friend brought me over a hospital-grade pump, and I also ordered medication, Domperidone. And I had previously talked with my doctor about the possibility of me inducing lactation and would that medication be safe for me to take. So I had already had the thumbs up from my doctor to take that were the situation to arise. And I put her to the breast. And then it was just a process of um, pumping and putting her to the breast. And that's how I started. Cool. All right, well, when we come back, Rose will discuss how common it is for a mom who has induced lactation to reach a full milk supply, as well as tips for starting this process. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back to the show. We are here with Rose Davini Jackowitz, an international board certified lactation consultant and uh, a consultant at Kaiser Permanente San Diego in their outpatient lactation clinic. And we're also here with Tiglin, a mother who has um, induced lactation for her baby. And so obviously we're talking about induced lactation, um, breastfeeding without having given birth. And so um, our next question for you, Rose, is Rose, how common is it for a mom who induces lactation to achieve a full milk supply, and which factors impact her chances? Um, A lot of it I have found over the years is um, attitude of the health professionals, because many times moms are told, oh, that's a nice thing to do, but you won't make any milk. And so we set moms up for failure right from the beginning, saying, well, you know, it's probably not going to work. Well, we know it can work. Historically, in other cultures, it has worked very well. Lenore, and her, she had not been pregnant, and she produced a full milk supply for her, her preterm baby. So it absolutely can be done. And I think letting moms know it is an awesome thing to do. It is a challenge, and it does take time. It's not something that you can do generally over just a couple weeks. It does take several months, and to maximize the full milk supply, it most likely requires the full protocol although it has been done you know if you've relactated I had a friend who it had been like four years and uh, technically she relactated Um, it happened it happened to be not for a baby but for treatment of a family member with cancer but that's that's another topic right there and within six weeks she was producing 24 ounces a day oh my goodness and that was just with the use of um, pumping and Don Paradon. Wow. And I guess just to put that in a in a frame of reference, so a full term um, healthy yes. baby would be taking somewhere, you know, a six month old baby would be taking anywhere between uh, twenty seven to thirty five ounces a day. Right. So she pretty much was she was pumping three ounces eight times a day. Oh, wow. That's and amazing. And so <laughs> it it absolutely is possible and I think supporting mom and being very positive but letting her know it does take time. The sooner you can start, the better. Absolutely. Okay. Are there any other factors you would say that impact her chances? Um, overall, yes, her general health. And it's just like any woman who gives birth. Some of, some women who have a history of infertility or have um, maybe a history of, of breast reduction or have situations where maybe their breast is, is underdeveloped, even though they give birth, they may make a low milk supply. So that wouldn't be any different than a mother who is inducing lactation for her baby. She may have a potential for low milk supply depending on her history. Okay. Tiglin, were you able to achieve a full milk supply with your baby? Yes, I was. How, that's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> uh, how yes. long did it take you and um, did it take a while just to bring in those first few drops? It did. I had... Um, I brought my baby home. She was 18 days old and weighed four pounds, zero ounces. So she was a pretty tiny little thing. And um, while she latched on great, and it seemed like she latched on and sucked great, her, her suck wasn't strong enough to draw the milk through the tubing from the lactate from the supplemental nursing. So I wasn't able to get rid of bottles and just nurse her with the supplementer full time, which is what I wanted to do. So instead I had to keep, we kept practicing nursing while I continued to bottle feed her. And even, even feeding from the bottle was difficult for her. And, um, and then I also pumped 
and I tried to pump just as many times as a day as I could. I kept the pump in the middle of the living room so that it was always right there. <laughs> and it was, it was probably two weeks before I started to see drops of milk. And um, it was about six weeks before I was able to transition her to be fully at the breast and eliminate bottles where she was nursing well enough that she could draw the milk from the at-breast supplementer and I could ditch the bottles. And once I got to that stage, I decided to stop the pumping and to instead spend that time with her at the breast. And fortunately, she was. She loved nursing, and she <laughs> would pretty much latch on and nurse twenty four seven. So I had I had a good partner, and in help in bringing in my milk supply, and I, you know, I made the goal of you know try making sure that she was nursing at the breast a good fourteen times in twenty four hours, and I had done a lot of the research on what makes women more successful and had read about how women in traditional cultures have a much higher success rate and um, that one of the theories is that in those cultures, the baby is physically in contact with mom most of the time. And, you know, I read stories about where they would just, you know, bring in women and, you know, put them in bed with an orphan, basically, and within, you know, a few days or a few weeks, she would have enough milk for the baby. So I basically tried to replicate that with my baby and just have her in physical contact with me as much of the 24 hours as I could and just really encourage frequent nursing, both with and without the at-breast supplementer. That is so cool. How, how long did it take you to glean to get um, that full milk supply? I was able to... Uh, stop the last bit of supplemental milk that I was giving when she, shortly after she turned six months old and was starting to take a few solids. But even the last, you know, the last um, month or two, I was only needing to give her supplements at, towards the end, like late afternoon and evening. I was able to, um, go most of the day without needing to give her supplemental milk. That is so amazing. And you hit on some really key points there of you were willing to keep your baby with you 24-7. And in those early weeks and early months, that is the key. We unfortunately live in a society that wants our babies on a schedule and sleeping, and, and that makes it hard for some moms. But hearing you say that you had read about it and had done it, that, that's awesome. That is most likely what really increased your milk supply because you started when the baby was almost three weeks old. You didn't start two months, three months before the birth. So that is an amazing story. And having the support of my family was really important. My, I mean, my husband was, you know, he would, I think he would go around bragging to people about <laughs> me <laughs> that I was nursing our adopted baby. And, um, he was. He came back from a conference with healthcare professionals, and he said, "Tegline, there were doctors there who didn't know that it was possible to nurse an adopted baby. How, how is that possible? <laughs> how come they didn't know?" But he would do things like he would take our older children out for the day, and I would tell myself that I was not allowed to do any housework. I would lay down with the baby on my chest, and watch movies way to go <laughs> do you hear that moms <laughs> that was my job for the day if he took the kids out of the house then I was on the couch with the baby on my chest that's all I was allowed to do all day well we talk a lot about you know kangaroo care and you know with Mills Bergman talking about how that is one of the ways to bring in a milk supply and so that's exactly what you were doing <laughs> and you yeah. are yes you are also doing what a lot of women do in the latter months of pregnancy where they're resting and taking it easy because everybody says you need to take it easy let me do all of this you're just having to you just happen to do it after the birth of the baby so that's perfect mm -hmm. right which is which is often the best time to do it i mean Absolutely. that's <laughs> i always tell my prenatal clients when i are you know in my classes they're like when else in your life do you have have the ability to 
sit and love on something um, without really anyone being able to judge you, you know, like, oh, she's sitting there and she's enjoying her baby. Like, it's not like you're being lazy. So I'm like, take advantage of it, you know, and partners too, like take advantage of this time. So I love that you did that because I really, I agree with Rose. I think that that was really, um, really insightful. And also it kind of leads into the other question too, because obviously there are challenges to this process. And I think one of the challenges is that a lot of us have so much going on that we don't actually get the time to do what Teglin is explaining that she did um, to really help bring in her supply. Um, what other challenges, Rose, do you see for um, bringing in a mil- inducing lactation? Well, she Teglin had the baby with her, so it was very it was easier for her to say, "I'm just going to be nursing." When a mom is inducing lactation and the baby's not here yet, she may still be working full time. She may still be working forty hours a week. And uh, if she she may have kids, she may not, but she still has to take that time to pump during the day. And I had one woman who started the process a week before going to vacation in Hawaii. I tried to talk her out of it because it's like, you know, you're going to be in Hawaii for two weeks. You really want to be going and pumping every four hours, you know, when waiting two extra weeks isn't going to make that big of a difference. And oh, no, no. I, and sure enough, she got on vacation and it was overwhelming. Now, had she already been in the process, had she had the baby, you kind of right. you just don't get to sit the baby and go, I'm going to go out to the beach or go out to dinner. So it is challenging because you're you're doing all this work as if you had the baby, but no baby. And you want to see those that milk come into the bottle. You may only see drops, uh, which is why I have moms pump into tiny bottles, not big bottles, because, you know, very small amounts in, in a tiny bottle looks like a lot. Um, and then just having the family support, that is so key. But yes, reminding them, it is a, it takes time. You are doing an amazing thing. Remember, we're kind of tricking mother nature we're trying to tell the body yes you're pregnant we um we want these breast changes we want to start (laughs) making milk and trust me it'll be worth it but it can be challenging and rose how how can a mother feed her baby while bringing in her own milk supply would you say a supplemental nursing system is the best case scenario possible I would say the supplemental nursing system is ideal because it keeps the baby at the breast. The best stimulation for the breast is a, ba- a good nursing baby. A hospital-grade pump is, would be next choice, but a good <coughs> nursing baby is the best, and, and that's where the supplemental nursing system keeps the baby at the breast. As far as what she's going to feed the baby, there's options of donor milk uh, from the milk bank, uh, which can be kind of expensive, but uh, we've had friends that have donated milk and or a um, appropriate formula for the baby. Okay. And uh, Teglin, how challenging was this process for you and, and what kept you going? One of the things that really kept me going was my baby. And I knew she, she didn't have a very good experience before she was born. Um, there was no prenatal care. There was drug and alcohol exposure. And I knew that she was very much at risk for long-term problems. And I knew that this baby really needed the physical contact of breastfeeding and the nutrition and the oral development. You know, she had so many strikes against her. I felt like it was my job to give her every strike in the other direction. And um, so, you know, that's something that motivated me. And it was the hardest thing was not knowing how much milk I would get and the, the progress feeling slow at the time. And, um, and I did think about giving up a lot and I did question, um, I know there was a comment that I had enough time to do this. At the time, I didn't always feel like I had enough time to do it. I was homeschooling a seven and nine year old and my seven year old has some special needs and um, and my husband's a firefighter who's gone for days at a time. So, you know, I was spending half the time as a single mom homeschooling, trying to induce lactation. And so I had to I had a friend who was particularly supportive and she told me that it was important to everybody that I continue to breastfeed the baby, not just to the baby, and um, that it was important for the whole family and that it was okay to let some things slide, 
like maybe the homeschooling lessons weren't going to be as great and perfect for a few months. And um, I've really had to make peace with that and choose to let things go for a period of time. And it's, you know, and my, my older kids are fine. They're not behind in school now, um, even though I, I did. I had to let things go to make time for it. And looking back on it, it's so easy to see that it was worth it. But in the moment, it was much harder to see. I think that's great advice for any breastfeeding mom. Oh, absolutely. And if you think about it, you wore your baby. You used the supplemental nursing system. Had you not done that, you would have been mixing bottles eight, ten times a day, washing bottles, sitting down to feed the baby. That may have actually taken more time than what you actually did. And the hard part was I was doing that. for. There were a couple of months there where I was spending a lot of time mixing up the supplemental milk, washing out the tubing, putting together the supplementers. It probably took an hour a day just to prepare all of the supplements and wash the tubing and, and all of that. And so there was a time period where I was doing the work of full-time breastfeeding and full-time bottle feeding even though I had it in bags and tubes. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You're right. Absolutely. And so that was, you know, that was the hump that I had to get over. And I was, as, I was, as I was able to delay the, the woman who her husband created the lactate for her, um, unfortunately she passed away a couple of years ago, but at the time she was available. You could call her on the phone and she would help you. And she had used the lactate with adopted babies years ago. And she's the one who told me to start delaying the first supplement of the day. So I played a little game of, okay, I didn't give any supplement until 9 o'clock in the morning. Ooh, I didn't give any supplement until 10 o'clock in the morning. And I gradually kept pushing it back until I didn't have to give any supplement until 4 o'clock. Wow. So I could go out for the day and feel like an exclusively breastfeeding mom. That is awesome. So, like, and it kind of helped it, me have that little mental game. And, you know, when I got to the point where I didn't need to give a supplement until late in the afternoon, then I was like, hey, this is okay. Yeah. I could keep doing this. Absolutely. I wasn't spending, I, I still was spending some time preparing the supplements and washing tubing, but it wasn't as intense. Well, thank you so much, Rose and Teglin, for your insight into inducing lactation. Um, This is truly one of my favorite topics. I love it. Um, And for our Boob Group Club members, our conversation will continue after the end of the show as Rose and Teglin will discuss tips for starting the process of inducing lactation, as well as for those that are in the thick of it. For more information about our Boob Group Club, please visit our website at theboobgroup.com. So here is a question from one of our listeners. Her name is Annie, and she's from Florida. Hi, Boob Group. I just joined the Boob Group Club, and I have to say my favorite part is the extra bonus content after each show. I usually listen through the app, but I'm wondering if there's a way to listen online as well. Thanks. Hi, Annie. This is Sunny. I'm one of the producers on the Boob Group, and thank you for downloading our app. I think it is probably the best way to listen to the episodes. I have all of our apps for all of our shows on my phone. That is the way that I listen to our shows. But if you happen to be in front of your computer and away from your phone, all you have to do is go to theboobgroup.com, go to the Members section on our website, and go to Log In. That'll take you to another page. You enter your login information. Uh, I believe it's an email and a password. Word, and it will take you to another page where you can download the content or just listen to it straight from your website, from your computer. Thanks so much for the question. Thank you so much to our expert panelists and to all of our listeners. And be sure to check out our sister show, Preggy Pals, for all of your pregnancy needs. And Parent Savers, our show for parents who have zero to three year olds. Next week coming up, or coming up next week, we have Annie, Cherry, and Jennifer back on the show to talk about what life has been like while they've been nursing their nine-month-old babies in our series, Breastfeeding Expectations. Thanks for listening to The Boob Group, your judgment-free breastfeeding resource. This has been a new Mommy Media production. The information and material contained in this episode are presented for educational purposes only. 
Statements and opinions expressed in this episode are not necessarily those of New Mommy Media and should not be considered facts. While such information and materials are believed to be accurate, it is not intended to replace or substitute for professional medical advice or care and should not be used for diagnosing or treating health care problem or disease or prescribing any medication. If you have questions or concerns regarding your physical or mental health or the health of your baby, please seek assistance from a qualified health care provider. Hey, mamas. Don't forget to check out Mighty Moms. It's our online community built for new moms just like you. Not only can you connect with other moms, but you can also join us backstage for special mom-only online events. And you'll also be notified when we're recording so you can join us as a special guest. Visit our website, newmommymedia.com, and click on the Mighty Moms banner. It's free. That's newmommymedia.com. See you there.